the whole study of education. And uh, after that, Andrew Lido will introduce the case study of women's human rights institute. So uh, I will begin with my experience of uh, getting engaged, uh, involved involving in this research project with Dr. Roxana M. In summer 2010, I worked as a research assistant to Dr. Roxana in the Center for Women's Studies in, uh, at OED. And uh, Dr. M was the head of CWSD at that time. She had participated in the feminist movement from the early 1970s and helped Dr. Dorothy Smith to co-organize feminist organizations in Vancouver in 1970. Uh, after 1980s, she came to OED and participated in, the wit uh, participated in and witnessed the development of women's studies and women's centers at the University of Toronto. In 1997, she presented a paper about women's organizing and women's studies in contemporary Canada at the Shanxi Normal University in China. As a minority immigrant women in Canada, Dr. N was concerned about the development of women's studies as a minor minoritized discipline in the academy. I first started work at CWSD as a research assistant and collected resources and literature about this project in 2010. In this job, I could certainly see the tension between the women's organizers' desire and the bureaucratic control by the institution. In summer of 2011, Dr. N and I, along with Jamie and Angela, uh, we uh, present a roundtable discussion at the Women's World uh, 2011 conference in Ottawa. In that Congress, we uh, want to exchange ideas and find solutions for the center's future uh, with other organizations. Uh, in 2012, Dr. N and I co-conducted an in interview with Dr. Dorothy Smith, the former organizer of Women's Studies Program at the University of British Columbia and the CWC at the University of Toronto, and reflected the early history of feminist women's organizing in Canadian universities. In 2013, I worked as a work study student at CWSD, and in December 2013, I witnessed the launch of the PhD program in women's studies at the University of Toronto. A big ceremony was held to celebrate this achievement for the discipline. However, while working at CWSD, I found that there was a crisis in organizing women's space within the academy due to the limited funding from the institution and the resources from the university. Why does this happen? What happened in the past? Who should take responsibility for the development of women's studies and women's centers in the university? What do we learn from the practice of feminist organizing in the university? With these questions, I decided to look back at the history of feminist women's organizing in Canadian universities. I used a limited amount of previous literatures on the subject, interviews, historical documents, and archives from major women's studies programs and women's centers in Canadian and deeply influenced by the Marxist theory. I, I examined this issue by using a historical materialist approach and a dialectic way of thinking in order to understand how feminist theory and practice in organizing feminist women's spaces have, have shaped each other since 1980s. Here's a picture that we present in Ottawa in 2011. So uh, I will divide the history from uh, three three uh, periods, 1980s, 1990s, and uh, after 2000. And uh, before that, I want to introduce a little bit to Roxana's theoretical, understand, uh, theoretical thinking about the interaction between three feminist movements uh, and the, uh, the influence, impact on women's studies in uh, Canadian Academy. So Roxana indicates that the first wave began in uh, late 19th century and ended in early 20th century, when middle class women struggled to gain the vote. The second wave began in the 1960s and ended in the mid 1980s. Not only white middle class women, but also working class women and black women participated in the movement and fight for equal wages in the workplace. After mid 1980s, feminist women's movement entered into a new era when a diverse ideology emerged. So she particularly focused on the third feminist uh, movement, which largely influenced nowadays feminist organizing. So she states that there, uh, in the third way, feminists uh, faced a tension between the different, different functions and organizations within the movement. 
Women's studies program became institutionalized and struggled by its material condition. Based on her personal experience as immigrant women, she pointed out that there is another tension conflict between women of color and the middle class families European descent. This tension leads to a fundamental division within the women's movement, which is separate family, feminist movement and the women's movement. And finally, she addressed the larger global context and the crucial role of nation state. She states that in this period, the state withdraw its social responsibility and the government largely cut back on funding for women and children. And uh, she also um, explored women's studies program by taking her approach of standpoint. She uh, believes that standpoint entails a starting point from outside of the institutions from which one can challenge conventional scientific approaches and the previous logical discovery within the institution. She elaborates the use of standpoint to understand globalized restructuring with which she explores the globalized region of ruling from the standpoint of immigrants. So I understand the history of feminist women organizing in the academy by taking the standpoint from individuals' different experience. One will find a separation between the theory of feminist women's organizing and the actual average practice in the women's studies and the women's centers in the university. I found that the feminist organizing in community academy is problematic with a long history of feminist struggles and a larger context of neoliberal and global restructuring. I argue that there is a tension between feminist knowledge and institutional power that came from the historical feminist struggles and movement and the current neoliberal knowledge base and globalized restructuring. So in the next uh, next part, I will briefly introduce the three periods of history um, in Canada, uh, in Canadian Academy. In 1980s, there is a major debate about whether women's studies is a disciplinary or interdisciplinary. At that time, there are uh, many struggles that they face. I summarized uh, three struggles. The first struggle is uh, concerned with the status of women faculty, the internal conflict, and the power relations within the institution. At that time, the majority of women studies professors were without the tenure, tenure or security of employment. Many female professors or employees within academy, academic departments have been fighting for pay uh, equity for a long time. The second struggle was how to get students involved in creating and developing uh, curricula and spaces for women. So even though an increasing number of students were getting involved in women's studies program, there's still a lack of um, uh, students' participation for, for the program. The third struggle was how to provide enough resources, literature, Research, research series and the methodologies and the community involvement in order to build a feminist orientation in a women's studies program. Uh, for example, we interviewed uh, Professor Dorothy Smith and she said uh, at the very early stage of building the women's studies program in Canada, they only had one uh, course material for teaching, so there's no methodology and no theoretical uh, materials for, uh, the, for teaching in the curriculum. So uh, I conclude that in that period, feminist organizing in Canadian University could be seen as evolving active engagement with the feminist movement and simultaneously struggle with identity construction, institutional power relations, student participation, community involvement, and the theoretical and material support. So uh, here is some uh, brief in information about at that time uh, many universities adopted to break uh, building women's studies program and women centers mm -hmm. in Canada. And in uh, 1990s, I want to briefly introduce three different models of women's studies program in Canada. The first model I want to introduce is the collaborative program model. I take the University of Toronto, of Toronto as an example. And uh, in 1985 uh, to 1995, the U of T started uh, launching their uh, collaborative women's studies program. Uh, they, they complete their first year of operation in 1994 to 1995. Uh, there are some major struggles they faced. The first was a lack of major courses and professors for women's studies. Since many professors were cross-appointed with other departments, they did not provide a specific courses for women's studies programs. 
the second concern was the economy of a career to program. And uh, since the women's study program belongs to New College, which is an undergraduate uh, unit uh, support college program, they couldn't get financial support directly from the, the New College. So the third uh, concern was the use of infrastructure, supplies, equipment, facilities, and the institutional base. Since it is a collaborative program, there is no uh, infrastructural support for specifically for their program. So the second type is the university support program model. I will use York University as an example. York University started its first PhD program uh, in uh, 1997, which is also the first PhD program in women's studies in Canada. And uh, they have some uh, different features, different from the University of Toronto one. The first, the university supported the interdisciplinary curricula innovation. So the whole climate was such as uh, was the program could get support from you, the university, which is good. And second, there was a, cri a critical mass of fa uh, family faculty, and a large number of professors were hired who led the innovative work of the program. Third, the university developed a broader climate for women's studies and the feminist initiatives. It elaborated, uh, established the Center for Feminist Research to enrich the resources available for feminist activities and the collaborative program. However, there are still some struggles. For example, uh, they found uh, difficulty for students to get jobs after that they get graduate uh, a degree from women's studies program. Okay, so uh, finally, the is a collaborative co-organized uh, graduate program model, which is uh, uh, there are also some uh, features that they have. First is the delay of decision making. Because when they doing when they are doing a collaborative uh, program, they have to make decision uh, collaboratively, so it will make a delay. And also a uh, shared resources, but uh, different uh, university will have different concerns and uh, struggles. They, so they, it's difficult to make the decision together. So finally, I will, uh, I, I, I want to introduce the. Uh, more about the, the third stage because I want to uh, give the time for both Andrea and uh, Jamie that they can introduce about their experience for families organizing after 2000. And, uh, but I want to concern one more uh, thing is about the new report restructuring. Uh, after 2000, an increasing number of families that that is proven in Canadian University shifted their theoretical and organizational development from a local to global emphasis in order to build dialogues with the global feminist movement. So there are uh, three, uh, brief, briefly three uh, ma major uh, uh, features after 2000. The first is more students get involved in feminist uh, uh, organizing and, uh, and women's studies at the university. The second is the university started to do more courses and activities that engage with global feminist movement. The third is there's more researchers on transnational and international feminist studies. So uh, still, there's a uh, there is a uh, neoliberal um, realization that largely uh, influenced the feminist organizing in the university. And I found uh, maybe through our today's discussion, we will have more idea about the, uh, the neoliberal realization. So Jimmy will present. Uh, so, if any of you don't know me, I'm the coordinator here at the center, and just to situate myself, I'm appointed part-time staff and the sole official staff person of the center itself. Uh, so the CWSC was formed in the early 1980s at Boise by a group of feminist faculty who recognized the need for a space for women on the campus. It was designed to be a hub for knowledge production oriented around feminist research and projects. In the early days, the center was organized around the Women's Educational Resource Collection, a collection of feminist materials put together by Frida Foreman, who was one of the early founders of the center. That collection was and still is a pretty big deal. There weren't many significant collections of feminist or women-oriented materials in existence, and researchers came from around the community and international workers, or by international universities, to do their work at the center. Uh, that, that collection does still exist. It's on the second floor. Of in the 1990s, Boise um, 
case and if you don't know which is the educational faculty and right that we're in now uh, merged with the University of Toronto and the University of Toronto had policies around centralized libraries so the resource collection was shifted to the library uh, to the OG library but the center continued functioning after the change as a hub for knowledge production throughout the 90s relying on grants brought in by faculty and researchers and in the late 90s and 2000s distinct groups and programs began to be created within the CWSC uh, so in 1997, Angela Miles, who is feminist faculty at Boise, who still is, uh, began the Dame Nita Barrow Distinguished Visitorship, a program designed to provide an opportunity for women from the global south who has played a leadership role in autonomous women's organizing to take up residence at the CWSC and teach a, an OISE course based on their activism. The Women's Human Rights Education Institute began in 2004 after collaboration with Alda Fascio, who had been in residence at the CWSC that year as a DMV visitor, and Angela will discuss that a bit further. WIA projects began at the CWSC in 2005 and established itself independently of, but is still associated with the center in 2008. Their feminist arts-informed research and practice group, headed by Pam Patterson, who's one of our associate scholars. And our institutional ethnography programming began around the same time, for which we are completely unique. Institutional ethnography is a feminist research methodology developed by Dorothy Smith, who's one of the founders of the center and former faculty at Boise. She continues to run the IE classes annually through us. And RFR, Resources for Feminist Research, which Lorena mentioned, which is located within the center. In the 2000s, the leadership of the center was under Paula Bourne, who was faculty at OISE, and though OISE contributed a basic annual fund of money to keep the center open, it was Paula's research grant managed through the center that allowed for administrative staff and community-based activities, and this has been how a lot of research centers are run in general. One faculty member takes leadership of the center and their grant supports it. Uh, when Paula retired and her grant ended, the structure of the center changed, and this is when the effects of the corporatization of the university really started directly impacting the functioning of the center. The funded staff positions were merged into one part-time position. The head position of the center became volunteer-based, and faculty started feeling pressure to keep their grants in their own departments rather than bringing them through the centers. So money very quickly got very tight. The way OISE is structured, there are departments and there are research centers, which is typical for most universities. Departments have students and faculties, they teach, they offer degrees, etc. whereas research centers specifically are sites of knowledge production. The founders of the center fought to create the CWSC as a research center, not a women's studies program, so that there could be an interdisciplinary feminist hub, and they fought to ensure that we were not, as a center, attached to a department, uh, which does make us unusual. Most centers at Boise do have departmental affiliation, uh, which would give them gives them increased access to departmental resources. While we exist outside of that structure, because we're not departmentally affiliated, uh, particularly uh, what it means is that our resources uh, become somewhat strangled uh, because we exist on the margins. Um, like for example, we lack a business officer, we lack an HR rep, these are things you would normally have through departmental structure, but we end up taking those roles on ourselves and things become tighter and tighter. Uh, and as you can see, actually, this marginalization is very confusing for everybody in the building for the administrative staff. Okay, but to the next one. Um, we're currently listed on the LHAE website as part of LHAE, and this is a pretty common mistake that happens throughout the building. People simply don't know how to respond to us or, or how we exist within the structure. And it's because we, we exist within the margins of this very rigid bureaucratic structure, structure that has begun to pit units against each other. So we now compete with other units for increasingly limited resources at the same time that it costs us more money to exist within the university. For example, as an internal group, we now have to charge, uh, we are now charged for booking classroom space for our own projects and events. And I know Angela's gonna give a few more details about this, this increasing tightness. Um, so we're not fundamentally structured as an income-generating unit, and this is why we're impact uh, by neoliberal. This is where we're impacted by neoliberalization because this is um, it's unacceptable essentially now to not be an income-generating unit. Uh, so we're all competing against each other for a limited amount of resources. It's a corporate environment imposed onto units that are designed for purposes other than income generation, and it's a specific unusual corporate environment and that lacks transparency and even 
limits the money we can, we're allowed to bring in for ourselves, the types of money and the amounts of money. And you'll hear more about that in a moment. Uh, and despite the renewed discussions around the importance of hubs that bring the academy community together as per the mandate of Boise, uh, the university only has the ability now to see things in terms of its own finances and complex bureaucratic system with no space for content, long-term planning, no way to address the continued marginal existence of the center and the invisibilization of women's spaces in the institution through our marginalization. There's no climate in which we can talk about these problems as philosophical. The university doesn't have a problem essentially with the existence of feminism on campus, but the university has no longer has the ability to even address this as an ideological or philosophical issue in any way because the bottom line is entirely money now. And a really good example of this is the men's rights activism movement that's been happening. They've been, um, they're a problematic group. This can be debated from our point of view. They're problematic. They're active on campus. You said that very fast. The, the men's, OK, so um, men's. I want to avoid giving them too much attention, but the men's rights activists um, are a group on campus who are ideologically anti-feminist. And the university has refused to engage with them on any philosophical level and allows them through neoliberalism to essentially do what they want and this is a this is it's an interesting juxtaposition because we have on the inside the university the only engagement we can have with them is financial engagement there's there's no content engagement with the university now on the outside it's all content engagement so we have this this clash where on the outside we have to address these issues without support from the university and on the inside all we can think about is money, money, money. Um, so the question that we're left with is how do we continue to function as a center of knowledge production in an institution that doesn't care about that content, only the bottom line. Um, I'm going to pass it to Angela, but before we do, the future of the center is currently in question. We know that uh, the position that I hold, we have been given notice that it's likely to disappear and our funding is in question. Uh, so I'm just going to set that up. So no, I'm just going to take that over. I'm getting depressed. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was depressed. <laughs> okay. So um, I'd like to talk a little bit. We're, we're sort of moving from a broad focus and narrowing down to look at specific examples of the way that organizing has been done and continues to be done. And I like to think this is a particularly successful example of feminist organizing that has worked in conjunction with the space of the university. Um, but we are also dealing with these kind of pressures that Jamie has spoken about. So I'd like to introduce briefly what the Women's Human Rights Education Institute is. So you will have a context for what I'm talking about. And then look at the history of the relationship of the institute with the center, with the university, why that it's housed here what the benefits have been, and what kind of pressure that we are under due to these neoliberal policies that are being implemented widely by the university. So the Women's Human Rights Education Institute is a collaborative project um, between the Fundación Justicia y Género, which is an organization in Costa Rica that was founded by Alda Fascio, who you'll hear about more in, in a moment, and the Center for Women's Studies and Education. And we have some other partners and partners that come and go over the years, partners for particular projects, um, but international in, in nature. Aldo Facio in 2003 was the Dame Mita Barrow Distinguished Visitor, um, and as Jamie mentioned, Angela Miles, who's, we, I, we have a grand matriarch in the room. <laughs> um, Angela, um, through her own blood, sweat, and tears, founded the Dame Mita Barrow, Barrow Visitorship to create this opportunity for activism, for feminist activism, to be recognized as, as knowledge, mm -hmm. as theoretical knowledge, and as praxis um, in the university space. And so I had the fortune of being a student in Aldous class in 2003 in this very room. This is the mural that our group produced um, in a course on um, human rights. And um, Angela and Angela Miles, I'm speaking about myself, Angela Miles and Aldo went on to found in 2004 the, the first Women's Human Rights Education Institute run as a non-formal or a non-credit based institute held in the university but separated. It was no longer a course, although it could be taken as a course from students. And so this is actually our 10 year anniversary of the institute this year. So the intention of creating this institute was to offer the space 
that focused on women's human rights activism and education, and not purely from a theoretical perspective, but looking at the theory that grows from the applied activist work of the women's human rights education movement, particularly through all those decades of experience working in that regard. And I'd like to honor our funders, because we have wonderful funders that really believe in the vision of what we're doing. Channel Foundation, Global Fund for Women, and QB, which is uh, the Canadian Union of Public Employees, for those of you who may not know, um, as a way to highlight that we don't get funding from the university. <laughs> but more on that in a moment. So what is the Women's Human Rights Education Institute? Currently, we offer two programs that have developed over the last 10 years. Um, the one that um, has been running every summer here once a year, uh, we call the Women's Human Rights Education Institute six-week program. Mm -hmm. And so 15 to 20 women's human rights defenders from around the world, representing a broad variety of people, backgrounds, areas of expertise, come here and learn from a variety of facilitators, both from within the university, within the Toronto community, as well as international facilitators. It's directed by Alda Fazio. She's the academic director. And so we were, um, it's very intensive, and in fact, we counted up the hours at one point, and you could probably get the equivalent of a college diploma for it, because it's six hours a day um, for six weeks. It's very intensive, a lot of um, very participatory learning happening. And each of the individuals who, is, who participates in the institute uses it as an opportunity to prepare a project that they will then implement in their own community, carrying the learning on um, in various capacities. So the four main areas of the curriculum involve focusing on CEDAW, which is the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the Women's Convention of the United Nations, understanding CEDAW, um, understanding the, the, the history of the women's human rights movement as a feminist struggle, rather than looking at human rights as something that the UN has, has given, because nobody, nobody gives or acknowledges rights without struggle there, so that's our, our starting point. Um, and linking that very clearly to feminist frameworks. And so um, looking at feminist theory and feminist analysis and how to understand women's human rights from a feminist perspective. And because we are an educational institution and because it's so important for people to replicate what they've learned and, and to share this vision, we have um, a focus on education in terms of pragmatic workshop planning, how to carry forward, what are the principles of human rights education, how do we do this in a way that reflects the vision for social change that we want, rather than looking at only as a technical kind of tool, although that's also important, how to use the UN system for activism. Mm -hmm. And then the last sort of area that we're, we've been calling living our rights. And so we focus a lot on process, group process, how we work together as very diverse groups of women in a learning space, how we reflect everybody's experiences, um, a focus on women's wellness, uh, breast health, yoga, um, one of our facilitators is an Anishinaabe indigenous um, elder who comes in and teaches about indigenous worldviews. So we really cover a lot in six weeks. If you want to know more, I could talk about it for hours, but I'm going to move on for now. I'd love to talk about it more if anybody is interested. The second program is a little bit more of a, a traditional kind of training workshop. Um, it's a five-day intensive that focuses on the CEDAW convention, the Women's Convention, as a tool for activism. And so that's offered as part of the Six Week Institute, and it's also offered as a certificate program in its own right. Great, thank you. And this is one of our 2011 group, just to give you a sense of the dynamism <laughs> of the space when you have women and, and men who are women's human rights defenders as well, who come from all over the world together to share their experiences and learning. So why was the decision made to host this kind of activist-oriented institute in an academic setting. Well, I already mentioned that Alda Fascio was here as the DNB visitor in 2003. And her experience of having time out from her work to theorize, to write, to reflect, to discuss with others was really fruitful for her, mm -hmm. personally and professionally. Mm -hmm. To have that time out of, she, she travels, you know, every week she's somewhere different. She's moving around, she's struggling to keep her funding for her organizations going like everybody else. And so the space that was created here in the DNB visitorship was something that she wanted to offer to other activists, 
to other human rights defenders who are living in really difficult work circumstances, really difficult um, living in conflict zones, um, living in spaces where there's no public space for women to move around. And so the benefits that she found, and this is taken from a letter that she wrote to our funders justifying for why we continue to hold it in the north, um, the relative safety and the orderliness of Toronto and the diversity of Toronto and all of the learning that can come from um, the best parts of Toronto, <laughs> as well as the difficulties of Toronto as well, and we do visit local organizations. Because the U of T residences were available, people coming from abroad could stay um, and have that time together out of their lives, but also be able to um, develop relationships and spend time together outside of the classroom as well. The university offered um, a space and a great deal of resources that Alda felt were really important to augment this kind of learning, such as having access to the library, the kind of films that we have here, the, the, the technology that's available that isn't available in a lot of contexts. And that also um, women who are coming here from other countries have the opportunity to build local connections that could help them in their work going forward, whether it was through funding or building um, relationships. And I'll give you a couple examples of, of how some of that has manifested later. As well, it created rich opportunities for students and continues to. Um, and will every year we have maybe one or two students who, who come into the program, and some of them have gone on um, to work as interns or have um, employment in other countries where they've continued to relate with women that they've met in the institute. Mm -hmm. And of course, the importance of continuing to create this space where activist knowledge is given priority and the, the importance of that symbolically as well as actually, right? having that knowledge recognized. And so the university never funded the institute from the beginning, but there was the support of the infrastructure and resources. And we benefit from the university's nonprofit status. That's how we're able to fundraise. fundraise. And I think it's really important for us to remember that a university is a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And actually, we have a charity number, and this is how we're supposed to be functioning in the world. I'm going to go ahead. I think I've addressed this. Yeah. So I wanted to cite two examples of really successful collaborations that have grown out of the institute. And you'll see in the picture, this is Mercy Chidi with Fiona Sampson. And Mercy was a participant in the institute in 2010. She was funded by the Stephen Lewis Foundation. And while she was here, through one of the facilitators that works with us, she became connected to this organization called the Equality Effect. Um, and Long story short, <laughs> Mercy was working very much at the community level with girls who um, had been, she was running a girl's home for girls who were survivors of sexual violence, who had no support in the community and were often in many cases still living with their violators. And after going through the institute, she decided she wanted to start working more at the policy level. And having met Fiona and started to connect to lawyers, both in her own country and Canadian lawyers, they developed a major case and had a really important decision this year that recognized the government and the police's failure to protect girls from sexual violence. Mm -hmm. So it grew out of this, this little space that we've created here. And this is uh, Wayun Guerra, also known as Carmen Ramirez Boscan. She's an indigenous woman from Colombia. The Global Fund for Women selected her for a scholarship to attend the institute in 2011. And one of these, one of the really beautiful aspects of holding this kind of institute in the university has been that the credibility and the prestige of the university can be used to support um, the certificate that the women get, but also their sense of having had access to maybe the better parts of formal education. And so in Wayangueda's experience, she hadn't had the opportunity to have formal education. And so these photos she actually put up on her blog of her university ID on the right there, the first time that she had been a student since, um, I think she started high school but wasn't able to complete it, and her certificate on the other side. And so this, you know, by us being able to support borrow and work with the prestige of the university, that's been actually important in some ways, um, in as much as it's also problematic. <laughs> but that's another conversation. <laughs> so the kind of challenges that we've dealt with in keeping this space alive have had to do first with university policy and practice, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the government policy and practice. So U of T has been unwilling to fund um, 
but has provided a lot of in-kind contributions. My office is here. We've been using the classroom spaces for many years, so on and so forth. But as Jamie mentioned, that um, has been changing. Mm -hmm. There's starting to be a price tag put on everything. So starting last year, because we are not an official course or program of the university, they started charging me an hourly <coughs> rental rate for the classroom. Excuse me. Um, and they've started policing, for example, why are we giving library cards to these people who aren't enrolled tuition paying students, and so on and so forth. So there's a greater degree of scrutiny and, and a sense of you know, trying to withhold services and put price tags on services that both the center and we've been dealing with. Additionally, the fundraising system of the university, again, I, I've said that you know, we, work, we work with the university's nonprofit status in order to bring in grants, but U of T is a very big bureaucracy. And so rather than the fundraising system having been supportive to us, it's been very difficult because there's a lot of red tape. It's very slow. And simple things like we're not allowed to um, put a, a button in for PayPal donations. Mm -hmm. And it takes years to get that kind of approval if you can ever get it. There's, there's an antiquated system of taking in donations. And so at the same time as the university is corporatizing, they're not emphasizing efficiency in the kind of services that they provide us. So in order for us to get money in, it takes a lot of time and energy, and we're under a lot of scrutiny to do that. As well, we are housed at the center, and so all of the financial and structural woes of the center become something that affect us as well. Right? So the uncertainty of the future of the center um, is problematic for us as well. Now in terms of yeah, let's go ahead. So the university's um, Well, actually, we go back to one slide, Daisy. The other thing that I wanted to say about this, because this is something I hope that we can we can talk about together, is the the second to last point: the lack of administrative willingness to recognize the theory behind the policies. So we we, we keep being told this is just the fiscal reality. We have to cut things. Mm -hmm. We have to start charging for things right? instead of recognizing that the university should have an operating budget and that using a classroom should be something that is just built in. They say, well, if you're using a classroom, you have to pay. That's how it goes. And so there's no recognition that there is an ideology at work there. Right? It's just presented as a fait accompli. This is how it is. And so it's, very, it's been very difficult for us in that way. Thank you. And the same thing is true at the level of the government. So there are a lot of problems. <laughs> Two things in particular that have affected us very adversely. One has been the sexist and racist and discriminatory immigration policies of this government that are getting worse and worse year by year. So at the beginning, starting the institute here, although it was never easy to get a visa to Canada, it was easier than it is now. And so year after year, the number of visa, visa refusals that we deal with of um, people who are trying to come from other parts of the world to participate in the Institute are making us question. We used to be able to make the argument quite strongly that um, it, it was worth it holding it in the North <laughs> for all of these reasons. But as it's getting harder and harder for people to get visas here, it's, it's been harder for us to continue thinking that way. We have to respond. And because the government is outsourcing visa services, there's no more accountability. So it used to be that you could call your member of parliament, and Olivia Chow's office was helpful to us in some regards um, in that way, and find out why people had been refused visas. But they put so many bureaucratic and administrative barriers in place now that there's no way to get information or, or, or lobby or, or you know speak back to these kind of policies. And the other thing is that this government is inherently anti-human rights. They're taking the human rights language out. They're closing down the human rights organization. So one example is rights and democracy, which used to be an autonomous institution, but funded by the Canadian government that supported human rights work. They were our funder in 2009, around the time that our government started trying to stack the board with conservative people and accusing rights and democracy of supporting terrorist groups because they were supporting Palestinian groups. Mm -hmm. So at that time, Rights and democracy went through a lot of difficulty. Frankly speaking, I didn't get paid for about six months because of that, <laughs> because the grant couldn't go through. And that's the reality that has to be recognized. When the grants are tied up, people's livelihoods are also affected by that. And then the government closed rights and democracy down. They've closed other human rights education-related funds. 
and Canada is refusing to allow UN investigators in and just embarrassing us. So it's creating a climate where we have to question our, um, our presence here. So the kind of questions that, that I'm asking, in terms of our project in particular, can we remain in the university? This has been a really wonderful partnership. It's been very meaningful for everybody involved. Students here have also had incredible opportunities that have come through the Institute. We have work-study students, we have GAs, we have people getting professional experience, fundraising experience working with us. But with all of these difficulties at the national and university level, I'm asking this question more and more. Mm -hmm. And also our funders, in some cases, find the university bureaucracy a limitation um, and have expressed that to me as well. We're under a greater burden to raise ever more funds, but the support is being cut. So how do we do this? <laughs> how do we eat and sleep and take care of ourselves and do all of these things that we have to do and the pressure that we're under? And this is the big question that I'm hoping to learn from everybody. <laughs> how do we challenge this neoliberal, ec neoliberal economic ideology in a meaningful way? When we're constantly in crisis mode, just trying to continue to survive, what kind of resistance can we mount and how can we do that? And this has to be a collective effort. And how do we survive without compromise? Mm -hmm. UN Women is taking funding from Coca-Cola these days. It's not something I would like to do. <laughs> I would not like to work with mining companies. Right. These are also questions that continue to matter. Mm -hmm. But the pressure is ever more on feasibility is linked to economic viability mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. instead of looking at the meaning of actually what we're doing. So for this year, we're continuing to offer our one-week program in Toronto, but we're trying out a new format, collaborating with an organization in Nepal, um, and having a two-week residential program in August in Kathmandu, um, with an online program to try to cover some of the other material in the six weeks. We would like to maintain our presence here, as well as expand internationally, and make the institute accessible to other groups of people. Um, but we're still trying to figure out how to, how to do this. Thank you. Sorry, I'm a little over time. So thank you so much for so much food for thought here. Um, thank you all.